Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We are in Isaiah chapter 34, and we're going to see a prophecy of God's judgment upon Edom, wherein Edom serves as the archetype for all evil nations. You can see also how God's chosen people, Israel, are spared. They are atoned for in their iniquity, like we saw in, our, in a previous devotion here. So God's going to pour out his wrath upon evil and show his mercy to the people who are his. We live in the New Testament, and so we cannot immediately draw straight lines from the original audience, the original intent of the book of Isaiah to our modern day context. But when Isaiah gets broad in his prophetic scope, talking about the ultimate uh, the ultimate justice of God for all time upon all evil nations. You can see how we are just as much contemporaries to the message as were the original recipients. So let's look at the text of Isaiah together. Chapter 34. You nations, come here and listen. You peoples, pay attention. Let the earth and all that fills it hear, the world and all that comes from it. Okay, do you see how I, I do, you see, do you see where I'm I'm coming from here. All right, we're going to use we're going to use Edom uh, and its its capital of Basra as the the main target later in the text, but it opens up with a broad scope to all peoples, all nations. The Lord is angry with all the nations, furious with all their armies. He will set them apart for destruction, giving them over to slaughter. The slain, their slain will be thrown out and the stench of their corpses will rise. The mountains will flow with their blood. All right, it's a brutal verse speaking to the dishonor visited upon the enemies of God because they're not even given a proper burial. All the stars in the sky will dissolve. The sky will roll up like a scroll and its stars will all wither as leaves wither on the vine and foliage on the fig tree. Fig tree is often emblematic of Israel. I've read at least two scholars who contest that, but I read the Bible and the, those scholars are wrong. The Bible's right. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, uh, that immediately precedes him. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the instances in which he overturns the tables in, in, in the temple and, and rebukes Israel for its fruitlessness. So you can see how it's about ancient Judah, and it's also about us today. It's very clearly about all nations for all time, because the word all appears like four times in the opening of this text. And this speaking about the, the sky being rolled up like a squirrel. You've seen, you, uh, you've, you've sung these words, if you've ever sung the old hymn, It is well with my soul. All the stars in the sky will dissolve. What is this talking about? I was describing some of this to my uh, to to my son Asa. We have these, you know, constellations in the sky, and a lot of them bear uh, bear pagan names. Even the names of our planets come from pagan mythology, like Venus and Jupiter, Mars and and Saturn, right? And uh, and it, this these have kind of left their fingerprints on on in many languages on the days of the week, right? Like like Saturday. Uh, like Monday, Moon's Day, Lunas, right? Um, and Thursday is literally Thor's Day. Uh, but we still have, especially in Spanish, all right? Where are my Spanish speakers at? All right, your, your, uh, your, your language seems to be a little bit, uh, a little bit better at this than English when it, com when it comes to uh, stemming the tide of, of pagan influence on, on our names for things, right? You still, you're, to you, Saturday is still Sabado, right? And, and Sunday is, is Domingo, which is good. These constellations, these stars, and these names for the celestial bodies, they refer to false gods. And so when the text describes the stars dissolving, my interpretation is that uh, the stars in the sky dissolving is that every pagan myth ever is just dissolved. And the one true God is known as the Lord. Every pagan faith system has been a lie. Every religion that isn't Christianity is a false star in the sky. It was a lie put forth by the enemy. In fact, even the devil himself is described as a fallen star who brings a third of the stars with him. And so in, in, uh, in that interpretation, you can see how these false stars, they're all demonic, right? Uh, that every religion that isn't Christianity is a lie from the devil. That includes Islam, includes Mormonism and, and Jehovah's Witness teachings. It includes the teachings of, of Krishna. It includes 
Buddhism, it includes, you know, it includes Hinduism, it, in, it includes Baha'i faith, uh, it includes any faith that isn't Christianity. And that, that statement would seem audacious to a self-described open-minded person, which is ironic, because if you're truly open-minded, you're open to this. The audacity of that is nothing more than the authority of Christ himself, and I believe him. The audaciously exclusive truth claim that is innate within Christianity rests not on my shoulders or my credibility. It rests upon Jesus himself, and he can take it, and I believe him. When he overtly makes the statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, he's speaking the truth. And by making that audacious, exclusive truth claim, which, by the way, was never found even among the Buddhas, all right, it was never even really found within the, uh, the, the demonic-inspired ramblings of Muhammad. Jesus made that claim to be the truth, and that, by default, excludes every other truth claim. Like the text says, all the stars in the sky will dissolve. The sky will roll up like a scroll, and its stars will all wither as leaves wither on the vine and foliage on the fig tree. So I think the foliage and the fig tree withering speaks to the legalism of ancient Israel, all right? Uh, the, 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 the leaven of the Pharisees, for example. So it's all of the false teaching, all the legalism that had become rampant within ancient Israel and all the false teachings that were visited upon Israel and surrounding nations by the conquests of Alexander the Great and Hellenism, uh, to the, the worship of Molech and Shemash and Moab and the, the false Babylonian gods, all of those are going to fade away. And along with them also goes the false teaching that may have been prevalent within ancient Israel. Let's continue in the text. When my sword, it's about to get really, really violent um, as God's about to pronounce his, his coming wrath upon Edom. When my sword has drunk its fill of the heavens, it will then come down on Edom and on the people I have set apart for destruction. This was what God decreed. This is part of Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9 is about Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and Esau, whose name was interchangeable with Edom. Jacob was the progenitor of Israel, inheriting the covenant with Abraham. Esau was the progenitor of Edom. And God had determined before these fraternal twins were born and done anything right or wrong, but just so that his purpose and election might stand, he had predetermined that in a perfect reversal of what was customary, that the older would serve the younger. He said, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. This means, respectively, that God loves Israel and hates the nation of Edom. There's an entire other book of the Bible that explains more of this. It's the book of Obadiah wherein God has set aside for himself, as is his right, as the potter, to make out of the same lump of clay, some, some things for noble use and some for common use, that he had set aside vessels of wrath. He made vessels of goodness. All right, from Israel, we get the covenants, we get the law, we have the prophets. From Israel, we get the lineage producing Jesus. But from Edom we see a demonstration of the wrath of God, and that is God's prerogative to do. It is what he has done. So this is, this is parallel with what we've seen in, in Romans chapter 9, that they are set apart for destruction. It is wrong, by the way, therefore, to look at Romans 9 and apply that in an individualistic sense. Like we're all a bunch of Jacobs and Esau's. God loves the Jacobs and hates the Esau's. That's common. That's a, that's a common misrepresentation of what Romans 9 is actually about, and it, and it would overtly neglect what this passage is describing, too, because it's very clearly about Edom. Right? It's addressed to Edom. It names the capital of Edom. In Romans chapter 9, we see the prophets of Israel, the matriarchs of Israel, the persecutors of Israel named. In Romans chapter 10, the very first thing that Paul says is that my heart's desire for them is that they would be saved, talking about Israel. He would willingly give up his own salvation if that could somehow save Israel. Romans 9 is about Israel. It's not about individuals. In fact, it goes on to say that not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. All right, meaning that now, because of Jesus, God's covenant with his chosen people, 
extends to all nations. This leads us into Romans chapter 10. Now everyone who calls on the name of the Lord to be saved, meaning people from all nations can now be saved. It was about Old Testament Israel, and now it's about everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a perfect, beautiful fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. It's a perfect realization as we see in Acts chapter 2 when Peter preaches from that same text. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Salvation was first for the Jew and is then for the Gentile. So it is it is hermeneutically fallacious to say Jacob I loved, Esau I hated means that God loves only a few people in the world, but he hates the vast majority of humanity. Rather, it is explaining God's wrath upon ancient Edom, all right? And that is arithmetically way fewer people than the vast majority of humanity. So looking, uh, looking, back, at, looking back at our text, we can see the Lord's sword is covered with blood. It drips with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has sacrificed in Basra, that's the capital of ancient Edom, a great slaughter in the land of Edom. And then what follows is going to give this nature imagery, uh, describing ceremonially unclean animals all sort of roosting in the land of Edom. See Leviticus chapter 11. The wild oxen will be struck down with them and young, uh, young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land will be soaked with blood. Their soil will be saturated with fat. For the Lord has a day of vengeance, a time of paying back Edom for its hostility against Zion. So in this regard, it's actually perfectly fair treatment of Edom that they had hostility towards God, and so God now treats them exactly as they want to be treated. He now gives them, he leaves them to the fruits of their own folly, uh, and he responds in kind, only he's the Lord. Edom's streams will be turned to pitch, her soil into soul, for her land will become a burning pitch. It will never go out day or night. It will go, uh, its smoke will go up forever. It will be desolate from generation to generation. No one will pass through it forever and ever. Eagles, owls, and herons will possess it. Long-eared owls and ravens will dwell there. The Lord will stretch out the measuring line, a plumb line over her for her destruction and chaos. Interestingly, elsewhere, Bible-wide, when we see the plumb line used, we see the measuring rod used, it, just, it denotes uh, construction. But here, God is measuring out Edom, has found her wanting, and now he's going to make sure that not a single thing is left behind. And the measurements are being made to see to it with absolute certainty that everything is utterly destroyed. No nobles will be left to proclaim a king. All her princes will come to nothing. Her palaces will be overgrown with thorns, her fortified cities with thistles and briars. Think about the, 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 the indicators of the fall of creation, the cursing of creation. She will become a dwelling for jackals, an abode for ostriches. The desert creatures will meet hyenas, and one wild goat will call to another. Indeed, the night birds will stay there and will find a resting place. So we see, like, we, we see uh, goats described here, along with other ceremonially unclean animals. Think about what Jesus said in, in separating the sheep from the goats. All right, this, is, this is a place that's overrun with wild goats. It's the land of Edom now. Sand partridges will make their nests there. They will lay and hatch their eggs and will gather their broods under their shadow. Indeed, birds of prey will gather there, each with its mate, because there's nobody living there. It's just desolate. It's become a wilderness for unclean animals. Search and read the scroll of the Lord. Not one of them will be missing. None will be lacking its mate because he has ordered it by mouth and he will gather them by his spirit. He has cast the lot for them. His hand allotted their portion with a measuring line. They will possess possess it forever, they will dwell in it from generation to generation. So this is, this is the perfect, just prerogative of the sovereign God to do exactly as he will. His will for ancient Israel, right now specifically Judah, who is more in line with the will of God, is his favor and protection despite their sin. He will discipline them, but he will never treat them the way that he did Sodom and Gomorrah. You can see some parallels between what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and 19 and what he's prophesying that he'll do uh, to ancient Edom in this text. But he never judges Israel the way that he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. He never judges Israel the way that he judges Moab. 
All right, he'll deal these killing blows to these enemy nations, but he will deal disciplining blows to his own people. It is good to be God's child because we are just as guilty of sin as those in these nations who are due such fire. All right, if it were not for the grace of God, we would be due such wrath. If we have the Son, then we are exempt from the wrath of God and atone for in all of our sin. But by default, if we do not believe in the Son, God's wrath remains on us. This wrath that God has for, for sin, um, this, this same kind of consuming fire that we saw would consume Assyria in the previous text. Now, this particular, this, this particular enmity that God has for the nation of Edom, we are exempt from all of that just because we're His children, not because of anything that we've done, but because we are simply... His. It is a good thing to be a child of God, isn't it? Today, there's even a city named Basra, right? And it's uh, it's bad news. Go figure. You know, who would have thought? Take a minute and just be grateful for who your dad is. It's not because of anything that you've done. It's simply because of the grace and the mercy of God. I'm Jesse. I'll see you for tomorrow's devotion.